Siegel's childhood was interrupted by the Holocaust. And over the years, she's written three books that recall the good and bad parts of that childhood. Her first book, Upon the Head of the Goat, depicted the early war years up until her family's removal to Auschwitz. Her second book, Grace in the Wilderness, describes her life after liberation in 1945. These two books were published in the 80s to great literary acclaim, including a Newbery Honor for Upon the Head of the Goat. Finally, in 2008, Aranka published one more book, Memories of Bubby, which lovingly recalls her cherished grandmother. I spoke to Aranka at an outdoor cafe near her home in Aventura, Florida. So, Aranka, all of your books are autobiographical. So what motivates you to share your life story with readers? Well, what motivated me to write from the beginning is to tell the story of the Holocaust, not only of myself, of course, or my family, but because of what happened to all of us. I needed to do something because out of seven children in my family, only three had survived. And one wasn't even in the Holocaust with us. She was living in Budapest, and we were separated. We arrived in Auschwitz. My mother, my older sister that I just spoke about, Violet, who I call in the book Iboya. She was 16. She had her 16th birthday, actually, in the ghetto. And I was not quite 14. And my little brother was six. His name was Shandor, and my little sister was Julie. She was four years old. Out of the ones that arrived in Auschwitz, five of us, my mother and the two little ones were selected straight for the gas chambers because the old and the young were useless to them. My sister and I were selected to work. And I had lived all through this. I was in three concentration camps, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, and one less known, which was really a work camp, Christianstadt. We somehow, through many, many separations and everything, we had survived. I mean, during the war, I didn't think that we had all, you know, that it was just going to be the two of us. Because for one thing, I could never, ever, ever believe that my mother had not survived. And even though I saw the crematoriums, I saw people arriving on trains, going towards the crematoriums, I saw the smoke and the flame come out, I smelled it, ashes landed on my arms, and I still couldn't believe it. And I realize now that what had really kept me going was because I didn't believe, and that I really strongly felt that when this is over, we're going to go home and mother will be there. I could just see her in the kitchen, she'll be there. And it wasn't until Bergen-Belsen, which was our last camp, we, we were uh, liberated there. And the way I was finally faced with the fact that my mother did not survive is when the Jewish men came out from their camps, because no defense was open, they kept asking all of us women, you know, have you ever met this one? Have you met, ever met this one? Giving us names and the towns they were from and everything. And I only saw one husband and wife connect, just the two of them. This woman walked up to this man and she said, you don't recognize me. And the man kind of, you know, just stood there, he didn't say anything. So she threw her arms around him and she said, it's okay, as long as we're together with her husband. And all this time, you know, some of these men just, you know, wouldn't give up. They kept describing the people and all. And finally, when they realized how many of them got the answer that they had perished, they decided they would uh, form a, a minion. And they sort of got into a little group and they started to say the prayer for the dead. Yes, Gadash, yes, Gadash, Miravo. And those were the words that suddenly made me realize that my mother didn't survive. 
that when they, you know, I heard those words, I knew those words from my grandfather's funeral. So it was a horrible, horrible uh, change inside me because I left because I thought, you know, there was hope. And now, and now that I realized that there was no hope, I just really didn't know what I was going to do with myself. We couldn't go home. There was no way to go home. We were very, very, very sick. I weighed all of about maybe 60 pounds. We came with some stretchers and picked up the ones that couldn't uh, even get up, you know. By that time I had dysentery and typhoid and big boils on my face. You know, people tell me nowadays, I'm 78 years old, oh, you have such nice skin. Really, I get this so often because it's a family thing. My mother did that, had the beautiful skin, my sister, my daughter. And each time I'm reminded how I didn't think I would ever get rid of those big boils on my face. Anyway, they picked me up on one of these stretchers and they took us someplace where they put us on tables, put us on tables and they sponged us off. And as soon as the hot water, warm water hit my body, I went out. Don't remember getting to the hospital or anything. I was really just out. That I really wasn't aware of too much of what was going around me. My sister, God bless her, she was the one that hovered over me and then there were some strange doctors. Some of them were volunteers from Italy and they weren't four fresh doctors there. And one of them had the same type of blood as I, so he gave me a transfusion of his blood. And then I went to live with a Swedish family. They took me just like we adopted a little dog, you know. <laughs> they picked me up and asked me, and they picked me up in a factory where mm -hmm. we were working, and they wanted to know, you know, if I would want to come and live with them. They lived in the country, and, you know, I would have good food and so forth, so who could resist in my, my place? So, of course, I lived with them for a while. And all the time I was thinking I have to do something. So I started to write a diary that I'm going to tell people what happened. I wrote it in Hungarian because I knew the Swedish people wouldn't be able to read it. But then by the time my visa came through, and here I'm making a big jump because I know you don't have time. The time came after three and a half weeks of waiting for our quota and finding our relatives in America, I realized that they would be able to read the diary because they could read Hungarian. They could read Hungarian. I destroyed huh. it. Well, I actually, I wanted to ask you about your writing, not yeah. so much in terms of the diary, but in terms of your books. You've written three books, yes. all based on your life, and they are, they've received literary acclaim and they've received prizes, but you've only written three books. Why have you not written more books? Because you're such an excellent writer. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I was still keeping a, lot, a diary here too, but I wrote it so differently because now I didn't want to go into the really deep stuff and stuff that I considered people didn't want to read about. But I did start to write a diary again. But then I got married, I had two children. I kept writing the diary, but I never thought of, you know, ever being able to do anything with it. It was just for me. And I was going to school with my children were going to school, I decided I wanted a degree because if I really will write, I need to be an educated woman. This is what I told myself and I had hardly had any education. When I got my degree at age 47, but after my children went to college, uh, that's when I sat down and write, and I wrote seriously. When I wrote about 500 pages, <laughs> I thought maybe something has to be done with it, and my husband was very, very encouraging, all through my education and everything. Really, I, I was afraid to hope, so I just thought, well, who knows what's going to be and whatever. And I waited a long time for hearing from them. And sure enough, he sold it to Farrar's Rousseau Shiro. So now I thought, you know, I have to tell the rest of the story. And the book was edited down to 225 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote the second one real soon after, mm -hmm. because that was a sequel. Right. Because this was pre-war, it stops when we are boarded on the cattle cars. Right. And now the publisher gave me an advance, and he said, write the sequel. 
because the first book was just really unbelievably successful. So I did write the sequel. But soon after that, my husband got sick. So those eight years that my husband was sick, I just wanted to be with him. So I didn't write. After he passed away, then it took me a long time to get myself into it again. And that's why the new book. But there was a lot of years in between. Memories of Bobby is your new book about your grandmother. Yes. And it was a Sydney Taylor Honor book. It was a National Jewish Book Award finalist. It was on the um, New York uh, New York Public Library's list of 100 best books of the year, right? Um, so tell us a little bit about Bobby. Bobby, my favorite character. <laughs> well, I was very, very close to her, and I looked up to her. Uh, she was just uh, my idea of... Uh, but I wanted to be when I get old. <laughs> and sometimes people tell me, you know, uh, some relatives, some cousins, that I am a bit like Bobby or a lot like their mother, the cousins whose house and lived, I lived in when I first came over, they used to tell me that. So anyway, she was a little old lady with very little education, but she spoke several languages. She spoke Hungarian, Yiddish, and Ukraine. She could read Hebrew. She was extremely, extremely religious. Oh, God, I had to watch every step as a child <laughs> that I don't do something wrong because she would get very cross with me. She can be very serious, very loving, but very strict. I learned to speak Yiddish from her because we spoke Hungarian in the city at home, and she lived in this little Ukraine village. And uh, she was like a little person everybody looked up to, not just me. The Ukraine people came to have her and, uh, read their letters, because they were mostly, you know, um, uh, that's the word? Illiterate? Illiterate. Illiterate, illiter yeah. They didn't even care to learn. There were schools there. They had their seven the children. They read it. They worked in the fields. And the Jewish people came to, him, to her to ask uh, her advice. She was extremely charitable, which I admired so much that she liked to share. And my mother, by the way also picked this up from her, that whenever she thought we could spare something, she would say, take it to such as such. Tell, tell them we have too much of it and we can't use it. So I admired all these things about her. And she was very, very good to me. I learned all the stuff that a woman should know from her because she taught me women have to know how to cook, how to take the children. But those are just the two major things. You also have to know to read the books that a wife is supposed to read, a mother. There were special books for women. Then I also have to know about charity and all the other things that were here in Shkai, part of what we were supposed to do to be true Jewish women. You know, it makes me think of Bobby all the time. She should have been here. How can I tell her? So I do tell her. I actually talk to her and I tell her. And I sometimes think that she really hears me, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that we really, he, she knows what I'm doing and that, you know, I know she's still someplace where she can understand and hear and see. She would be proud of you. I hope so. I hope so. She would, but then I certainly think she wouldn't. I can keep a kosher <laughs> home, <laughs> you know, and I'm not religious the way she was. And uh, I'm always asking her f to forgive me for that. Mm -hmm. But that's, that, that was my Bobby, and I adore her, and she's always, always in my thoughts. I always think of her when I'm doing something new. First time I learned to drive a car. First time I went on a throughway. Oh, if Bobby could see me, what would she say? You know, <laughs> and all these things. Aranka Siegel, thank you so much for lunch, and thank you for the interview. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to meet you. You are a wonderful young woman, <laughs> and I admire you for your work and just for the kind of person you are. I'm a very good judge of character. <laughs> it doesn't take me very long, really, to know what a person is about. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I really Aranka Siegel was the Book of Life's guest during the Sydney Taylor Book Award blog tour. Read that earlier interview in the January 18, 2009 post at bookoflifepodcast.com. 
The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries online at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Lesmer String Band at freilachmakers.com. Visit our podcast website at bookoflifepodcast.com or listen to the latest episode by phone at 916-313-3820. We welcome your comments and questions at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and happy reading.